Well, good afternoon. I guess I'm pleased to be here this afternoon. Uh, it was a good trip out. You'll see by the title of the, uh, the talk, Societal Values, Science and Wetland Policy. So it, where I say the section's been introduced as what makes policy effective, and again for the title, I'm going to try to draw these together by the, by the end of the afternoon. But first off, what I'm going to be doing going through is rather than not getting right actually to the part of how it makes it effective, I'm going to have to go through a, a little bit of background on, on policy. We start talking about policy, we start looking at wetlands. You know, wetlands are not necessarily always land, they're not always water, they're somewhere in between quite often. And when we look at it and say, well, what are the values associated with, with wetlands? We talk about wetlands as given ecosystem services, and where those ecosystem services are really dependent upon the, the ecological components and processes that take place within the wetlands themselves. So you have biological and abiotic uh, components and the chemical process going between them, and those actually help deliver the, the actual functions which actually provide those ecosystem services that people come to benefit. So whether they're provisioning services, such as actually going out and uh, harvesting timber out of wetlands, uh, removing peat from wetlands, some of the regulating services, such as you know, for flood control and regulations. In many parts of the country, there are cultural services that are heavily recognized. Uh, people get some aesthetic value of actually seeing a pristine wetland, see the wildlife that's associated with it. And then we actually have some of the supporting services, which is just generally the overarching values associated with them. When we look at ecosystem services, you go back to actually what the definition of ecosystem services are. It's actually the benefits that are provided to society. It's very anthropo anthropogenic terminology but essentially that's what it is. It's ecosystem services of benefit to society and individuals. And all these services are looked at as how they may contribute to overall human, human well-being, whether it's in health, economics, social structure. And these are actually undertaken through livelihood strategies. The livelihood strategies are dependent upon the wetlands and they're adopted by society. These uh, strategies may be expressed at the local level or town level, drawing the services directly to that town from the wetland. And this is very important, particularly for many of the developing countries where many of the communities are actually very wetland dependent. And when you start going to some of the international meetings, you hear the countries coming forward and say, what are you actually doing to actually help support our wetland dependent communities? How can you actually provide the management structures what are the policies that must be undertaken to actually help us assist in that area? Perhaps more in developing countries or developed countries, they're more indirect. How the wetlands that may actually be remote from the community actually are providing those services, whether it's providing, ensuring you have quality water, removing contaminants from the water supply. We want to look at what the global estimates of wetlands are. Why is there actually a concern? Why do we have to be concerned? The global estimates of wetlands, both inland as well as, as coastal, they actually vary quite considerably, uh, depending upon the source that you're looking at. But generally, the common number that's generally accepted now is around 8 million square kilometers of of wetland area. Some estimates are higher, some are a bit lower, but in some ways it's actually just a reflection of the knowledge that we actually have. So since around 19, the early 1900s, it's been estimated that over 50% of the world's wetlands have been lost. In the past two decades, it's estimated that 35% of the mangrove areas across the, across the world have also been lost and up to 80% in some areas. What you actually see in the, 
the top left is some work that is just very preliminary work that's being undertaken by UNEP, United Nations Environment Programs, and the World Conservation Monitoring Center for the Ramsar Secretariat. Using the uh, process similar to the Living Planet Index, we're trying to identify trends in wetland loss globally, and these are the natural wetlands. And as you can see, if based on 1970 as, the, as a base year, and the estimates that are weighted for regional estimates of total wetland area, you're essentially since 1970, it's estimated that there may be between 25 and 35 percent of natural wetlands have still been lost. And if when you extend that to look at it regionally, it breaks out a little bit more to so actually see some regional variation in the loss of, 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 loss of wetlands. Uh, essentially, when you look at it for North America, comparative to what some other regions, North America is the, uh, the blue line. Generally, we're looking at approximately another 20% loss since uh, 19, early 1970s. Other parts of the world, particularly in Asia, has some very heavy extreme losses. What's not shown here, though, is there is some belief that actually natural or artificial wetlands is actually increasing in area and may actually start to offset some of the uh, natural loss that has occurred. But the big question then comes down is to what is the values associated, what are the functions that are coming from those uh, restor either restored or created, created wetlands. Some context, some context locally. Canada's has estimated to have anywhere around 25%, but I have that actually in kind of a question mark. Do we actually have 25% of the global wetlands? When you look at some other published reports, that number actually varies between 14 and 20%. And again, it comes back down to the point is where are the wetlands and how much there actually is, and how are you actually classifying and determining uh, what wetlands are. Regardless, Canada has had some very historic wetland loss. It's been estimated that we've lost 20 million hectares, which approximately 15% of Canada's total wetland base originally. This actually is much higher in different parts of the country. The northern areas you see has been estimated to have very little loss, but once you get down into the settled parts of the country, no losses can be get quite high. You lock, look in some of the uh, corridors, these uh, along the St. Lawrence, 80 to 98 percent in urbanized regions, 70 percent in central prairie pothole regions, 65 percent in Atlantic salt marsh areas and 80% in the uh, southern Ontario and St. Lawrence hardwood. Losses actually have been very similar south of the border. This is our work done by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as part of the regular monitoring program. And you can see the wetland distribution around the 1780s showing the percent wetland area in the different colors. And then you compare that to the 1980s where it shows what the loss that has occurred based upon the volume or the amount of wetland area in each of the each of the states. So some of those areas have lost 25 to 50 percent of their wetland area as well. And overall it's estimated that the United States uh, has lost approximately 50 percent of their wetland area. What I want to show here is some work recent work that has been done in Southeast Asia and South and East Asia. And it's really looking at the loss of coastal wetlands that's occurring. What you want what take from this uh, uh, slide is looking at where the threats and issues are. And the issues are no different than what we are encountered here. Having reclamation been occurring for agriculture, loss for doing to urbanization, expansion for expanding populations, demographic pressures, uh, coastal protection works. And in some areas, it's, uh, particularly when you look up in the area of the Yellow Sea and the Bohai, which is, I don't know if this has a pointer on it, it's the area just in between Korea and uh, China. That area has some very extensive reclamation activities that are now occurring in some primary, uh, very important areas for uh, the uh, Asian water uh, flyway that's occurring for many endangered species. 
But again, it's the pressures that are occurring, and these are direct pressures as well as indirect pressures, and they also occur in the same pressures that are occurring here. So what we have is both direct, what's called direct and indirect drivers of change. And these drivers of change actually operate at multiple levels. They can operate at local, regional, and global levels. For example, the global demand for energy and agricultural products actually has an impact locally. The pressure to provide food to an expanding population is putting pressure here to actually grow more food. It's an economic opportunity for ourselves but it's also a realization that there are other pressures out there that are impacting upon us. There are also it, it, the global issues associated with trade have some impacts. Even current uh, development uh, opportunities through uh, international agencies for helping communities and developing countries to move forward. Some of their uh, programs may have undesirable consequences or unintentional consequences on, on wetlands and cells. So they may be trying to improve the human well-being by health and education, by improving water supply, but then it may actually have the a consequence to wetland dependent communities or they're the ones who are actually being impacted, whereas other people are actually gaining the benefit from the changes in how those wetlands are used. So when we look at wetland policies, they need to be developed with these drivers in mind to try to avoid or minimize the the impact on ecosystem services and ultimately the human, human well-being. So the policies essentially are to look at intersecting where those red lines actually are. Those are where the, uh, the, the policies are expected to try to influence uh, demographic pressures, supposed to try to influence uh, changes in land use, for example. And again, it's all to try to move forward to look at the ecosystem services, ensure that they are being maintained and particularly to deliver that human well-being, whether it's at the local level or at a global level. A couple of appropriate statements. Probably have recognized, have seen these before. We never know the worth of water till the well is dry. English proverb. Men do not value a good deed unless it brings a reward. Ovid before present 43 to 18 AD, Roman poet. One I particularly like is Mark Twain's Whiskey's for Drinking and Water's for Fighting Over. <laughs> and it's very true. The benefits of wetlands have long been recognized, both for providing services and functions. Here we have a bas relief on the tomb of, I don't know if I can recognize or how to pronounce this word, this former pharaoh, Akintiptop in 2400 BC. So it shows they're actually getting a value from the wetland itself, getting the, a waterfowl. If you look at the whole history of the Nile, the flooding that occurred there was very dependent upon bringing sedimentation, improvement to agriculture. It's well, it's well recognized, well accepted. You have the Aswan Dam went in. You had the loss of that sedimentation that was occurring on that Nile plateau in the floodplain, which has affected their agriculture. So one desire was to have uh, a reservoir for water to provide hydropower, but it had un undesirable consequences on the agricultural production. And more recently, we have the results from the Global Initiative on the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, where they're actually trying to assess the different values uh, that are being provided by the various ecosystems around the world. So they're looking at assessing the overall value of working with natural capital and how it helps determine where ecosystems can provide goods and services, and particularly where they actually may offset some of the costs associated with technological improvements, alternatives, and lead to significant savings. We all have heard about the example in the New York with the water supply, payments for ecosystem service, nature saves money. Five, five million or five billion U.S. dollars. Water supply provided to farmers in New Zealand, Mexico for payments of ecosystem services. Uh, in France, 
the ensuring that the bottled water from uh, Vitel is pure. They pay the local community in the watershed above where they draw their water from to practice certain approaches to ensure that that water is not contaminated. Venezuela, boy potential replacement, cost of hydro dams. South Africa, payments to the pay to uh, payment of ecosystem services, affects jobs, savings of dollars. These examples, there are numerous other examples around the world that you can draw upon, you can look at through the, the ecosystems or the economics <laughs> of ecosystems and biodiversity reports. But we're actually going to return to this whole question of valuation just later on. So I'm getting to a couple of points here. <laughs> We've talked about the, the value of wetlands. We looked at how important they actually were historically. Uh, the interest people have them, the values of the ecosystem service that are coming from them. This is not a recent uh, realization. Concern was being expressed even in the 1960s with the loss of wetlands along many of the world's avian flyways. And this was concern was culminated in 1971 with the, uh, the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. The Ramsar is actually a city in Iran. This building is actually where the uh, convention was actually discussed and negotiated. And a lot of people think the Ramsar Convention actually just deals with waterfowl. Even though it had waterfowl in its original name, there are a couple of historical reasons for that that are generally not well known and dealt with but the country to the, to the north and to the, it's Russia at the time. However, it's essentially it is much uh, broader than for waterfowl. And this can actually be seen when you actually review the convention text. Right up within the convention text, it talks about wetland as recognizing the interdependence of man and his environment. You have to forgive the terminology that they used back then. They would have probably used human society rather than man. But this was the late 60s and early 70s. They also note that it's being convinced that wetlands constitute a source of great economic, cultural, scientific, and recreational value, the loss of which would be irreparable. Considering the fundamental ecological functions of wetlands as regulators of water regimes and its habitats supporting characteristic flora and fauna. So even in those early days, they were recognized the broad services and functions that were coming from wetlands and bringing it into a convention that people could and nations could join into. Convention text speaks to the importance of wetlands to society and has as its foundation the designation of wetlands of international significance but also deals with the international cooperation and particularly the wise use of those wetlands. And actually one of the articles when they sign on to the convention talks about and directs the contracting parties to formulate and implement their planning so as to promote the conservation of wetlands under the list of wetlands of special significance and as far as possible the wise use of wetlands in their territory. So it's not just those ones they designate it but deals with all wetlands to be used wisely and sustainably. The convention has grown to 168 nations since uh, it was ratified, brought into force in 1975. And a mechanism to achieve this was brought forth to look at the formulation of national, national policies. It really came forth in 1987 at COP3, which was actually held here in, in Canada, in COP4. It uh, was noted to on the reporting that was actually done by countries as part of their national reporting was how many actually had national policies dealing with wetlands or their equivalent, whether it's under legislation or regulation. And since then, Canada was one of the first countries to actually have a national wetland policy, and that was 1991. And actually, it was proved to be the leader and is actually used as the template for many other countries around the world upon which to develop their national wetland policies. So up to now, 
by the time of the last COP, the Com Conference of the Parties in 2011, we're now at approximately 50% of the world's nations actually have a national policy. I may draw some fire from other people who deal with policy, but I'm going to just very simply say policy in the simplest term is a principle or rule to guide decisions. It serves as an organization's statement of intent or commitment to some course of action or to some position. Policy statements hopefully clearly lay out how an organization responds to situations and guides decisions on resource allocation. The policy process, one would think, is rather straightforward at least from a science point of view, or science, scientist point of view, we have a problem, how do we fix it? So this part here is looking at a policy process, an evidence-based policy, adaptive management, understand the problem, develop potential solutions, put those policies into solutions into effect, and then evaluate success. This should actually move right forward. And when you look at it, you say policy, Contribution to the policy process itself, really though, extend beyond information to include critical thinking, objectivity, independence, and credibility. Science plays a critical role in evidence-based policy, and scientific expertise is increasingly recognized and sought to inform and improve the often complex decision-making in the legislative and policy process. Having a policy approved, however, is usually much more complex. I can use an example in my own province that my predecessor started looking at trying to develop a wetland policy when he first came to the province to work back in the mid-1960s under the different pieces of legislation we had at the time. We didn't have a wetland policy to 2012. So it took a long time. As a policy is very complex, it's an institutional process, interplay of many factors. So you see the center part of the policy process, that was the last slide that I showed you. And so essentially, when you start to develop your policy and try to get it into play, all these other factors are coming into play for your decision makers. They're looking at the organization context of what it's supposed to be implemented within. What is the political context? What is the risk to the politician? What is the risk to the party? What sort of flack are they going to get from the, from the landowner? The wider public context out there. All these decisions or all these factors are coming into play when a person or when your decision maker is trying to make a decision about, yes, I'm going to move forward with this, with this policy. It requires lengthy consultations. And again, just for another example, when we finally did move forward, to actually have identified that, yes, we need to move forward with a policy. This is followed changes to our legislation under the Environment Act, where actually finally wetlands were included as a standalone system within the Environment Act, which hadn't occurred, and that was done in 2005. We didn't have the wherewithal or the support to actually really uh, deal with compliance issues. And then all of a sudden, how it happened, I'm not sure. We had what was called the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act that came out in 2008, I believe. And that suddenly appeared. And within that, within that act, they had a number of priorities that actually had to be accomplished. And one of those was you will have, or we will have, an, we will have a provincial wetland policy by 2010 of known at loss and area and function. First we ever saw it. One, one month later, it was in law. <laughs> so it essentially went right through the first, second, third read and proclamation very quickly. What we realized afterwards, somehow our communication products that we were actually having, our discussions that we had, our environmental assessments that have been going through previously has started to have an effect. The uh, non-government organizations were out there, were talking about policy, it had an effect on our decision makers and they decided it was time to get a, get a policy. However, even though it's, it was stipulated under law to actually have that policy by 2010, it still didn't occur until 2012 after a lot of discussion, a lot of hesitation, and a lot of discussion with non-government as well as the local community. So 
just where I'm starting to grow into what makes it effective. And I guess where I look at it is that you've finally been successful, your policy has been successfully negotiated through the powers, corridors of power, you just convince decision makers that policy is required for the conservation and wise use of wetlands to deliver the multitude of benefits for society. Celebrate your success and now begin your work to ensure the policy remains relevant and effective. Policy is not static, neither is legislation or regulation. One thing you'll quickly find, and many of you probably have, if there starts to become a problem with the implementation of your policy, you'll quite often will be asked to come forth to your director, your deputy minister, ultimately your minister, and say, what's going on here? I'm getting a lot of flack from my community. How are you going to implement this? How are you going to improve this? If you don't, we can change. That's the power, that's the way our society works. You elect your people, and they are the ones who are generally closest to the ground. They are hearing what their constituents are saying, and they will act accordingly. You will provide your advice, and they may take your advice, or they may take other advice. What they need to look at is you still have to meet society's aspirations. So ecosystems cannot speak for themselves, but require an informed and supportive society to advocate for their sustainability. There are three areas which I believe are required for maintaining policy relevance and effectiveness. Knowledge-based decision-making in the areas of governance and implementation, and importantly, in compliance and communication. One of the key things that's required in order to move forward in policy dealing with wetlands is knowledge about where and what types of wetlands, where the wetlands are and what types they are. It provides the foundation for functional assessments as well as valuation as part of review and a permitting process. As seen here is an inventory of Canada's wetlands. And you can see that even though we had that diagram before, the picture before that, we contribute 25% of the world's wetlands, or 14 or 20. What you actually see here is where we actually have wetland inventory completed. Alberta is actually doing very well. The area that's complete or in progress. Ontario is getting there. Newfoundland Labrador is an empty area. The Northern Territory is pretty empty. And Saskatchewan and Manitoba, I know they are actually working towards it. Manitoba just released a new act dealing with uh, peatlands. I think it was announced last week. And one of the aspects within that is actually looking at an inventory as well. So there is progress being made. To maximize the benefit from an inventory, it has to have a strong science base. The classification has to be recognized as such, whether in the United States coordinate system or in Canada's Canadian Wetlands Classification System provides an ability to look at wetlands uh, nationally as well as regionally. A company in the inventory should be a program, and unfortunately I don't have it in my pro province, we're trying to work towards it, is a program to monitor trends in wetland extent and status. There have been a couple studies. This one was a relatively old, 1987, was trying to look at what were the status of wetlands at that time, provide the basis a lot of interest, at least from the National uh, Wetland Conservation Council at the time, to try to move forward in developing a national wetland inventory. It was not successful at the time, um, but there is, again, the progress that has now been taken through the Canadian Wetland Inventory, coordinated with Ducks Unlimited and a number of organizations it actually is starting to come to fruition. But there are some regional studies that actually have occurred to look at the status or the trends in wetlands here is in the, from the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture. Wetland loss here from between 1985 and 2001 is approximately 5%. Southern Ontario wetland conversion, poured an average loss of 3,543 acres or hectares per year for wetlands that are greater than 10 hectares, they were looking at large, large uh, wetlands between 1982 and 2002. So the loss is continuing, and the services that are being provided by those are also continuing. 
Trends in the status of wetlands are not common. Trying to look at what the trends in the uh, quality of the wetlands. All wetlands are not created equal, are not the functions that are provided by wetlands, they're not, uh, every function is not coming from a wetland. Where they're located uh, provides different values or functions associated with them. Here we're actually in Nova Scotia looking at a, an approach by Paul Adamus called WESPIS, Functional Ecosystem Services Protocol, and I understand this is also being looked at in Alberta as one of the ways to look at functional assessment. One thing about functional assessment, it doesn't give you the actual valuation of what those wetlands are. It can tell you what the ecological value is or ecological function is, but the value is a human-based input and has to be looked at regionally and locally about what that value actually means to the society that where those wetlands are located. I told you we'd come, be, come back to the, the TEEB work. Here they've actually looked at a number of different studies where they've actually valued different ecosystems. And when you look down at the bottom of that, that graph, the little star is actually represents the average value for price per hectare. And it's actually what they call uh, price parity, purchasing power parity, so it's not actually dollars. Looking at what the value of that wetland is based against the value, uh, purchasing power uh, rated against the U.S. dollar in the, in the country of interest to try to uh, ensure that the dollars are comparable. But coastal wetlands and inland wetlands generally are definitely providing a much higher value than many other any of the other ecosystems that were examined. Now again, local studies, you look at the, the range that's occurring there, and you have the average. Again, it shows that the, the value changes with the wetlands itself and how this. So local, local studies are very important to looking at the relevancy of the valuation locally. It would be great to actually have more local studies draw upon when discussing wetland values rather than saying relying on a valuation study that was perhaps done in Europe or Australia. We do have some that actually occur, and I know that's part of the discussion that's going to be occurring tomorrow as well. We have the credit value one. And we also, when you talked about the Ontario Greenbelt uh, this morning, the average value in, in the Ontario Greenbelt was nearly $5,700 per, per hectare. The total value of those wetlands within that Greenbelt area is $1.3 billion per year due to the high value that they attribute to it to water regulation, water filtration, flood control, waste treatment, recreation, and wildlife habitat. Another study that was done in southwest Manitoba was in Broughton Creek by, by DU. The economic value of the associated with the ecosystem services of nutrient removal and carbon sequestration between 1968 and 2005 was valued at $430 million. The economic loss per year is about $15 million in 2005, and it's projected to increase to $20 million per year by 2020 if loss continues in the wetlands of the area. One of the other aspects when we start talking about decision-based, knowledge-based, is question about the science policy interface, or what's become known as the policy science interface. Quite often, it's essentially, are we asking the right questions that policy decision-makers require? Do we actually go out and ask the decision-makers, what are the questions we should be asking? What are the research questions that need to be addressed. Valuation is one of the key ones that keeps coming forth. Another one is looking at and saying, all right, what are the restoration opportunities? How are you actually going to go, go about doing that? We have work that's going on around the country which can be applied, particularly that air, stuff that's relevant to, to uh, areas with a lot of peatlands, such as the uh, uh, Alberta, 
Nova Scotia and much of Canada, essentially. Work that's being done out of the University of Laval with Lane Rush Rochford, and also in conjunction with the Canadian Sphagnum and Peat Moss Association, looking at restoration opportunities, restoration approaches, techniques to restore uh, wetlands to actually start to be able to produce peat again after they actually have been removed. So there are there is research going on that actually has direct relevance. Last week we learned about some work that's going on developing of how to implement best management practice for putting forest roads in place. How do you get across? And that's some of the work that we were collaborating with was Forest Products International. And that's work that's going on across across Canada. And they just released a report that's available on the can be downloaded. So you conduct your research in a communicative and collaborative manner. Get, get partners involved. Create organizational capacity and culture. Courage has worked at the science policy interface. The other one, next one is governance and implementation. Clarity and definition. Something that you, that you can take to your politicians, more importantly to people you can take to your justice department and then willing to, to uh, go to court with you. When we actually started looking at our definition, which is at the, at the bottom, we base it directly out of the Canadian wetland definition that's shown above. There's a lot of terminology that's actually the same. The words are slightly different, but the impact is the same. And you also in the center there, you actually have one that's used in the United States. So generally, you're looking at those main characteristics for a good wetland definition that can be defended, saturate with water, hydrophytic vegetation, aquatic processes, biological activity adapted to wet environments, something that separates directly from the land or the total water. The other aspect about it is this, is ensuring you actually have the mandate to be able to do it. Uh, again, in Nova Scotia, when we looked at it, we start, when I started the process in 1992, uh, discussions with the local environment department, they actually had wording that says, well, you should be able to protect wetlands or conserve wetlands. So they actually put together a little directive, and, but they're unwilling to defend it. They're unwilling to take it to court because we really don't have the, they haven't put under the regulations or in the act or our ability to do that. So it, it took from there to 2005 when they actually revised the, the act to actually include wetlands under the act include wetlands in the activity designation regulations such that they could actually be assured that they could go to court and have a good chance of actually winning. You have in the United States the recent uh, initiative under jurisdictional wetlands. What are jurisdictional wetlands? Came out of that court case from 2001 and 2006 where the college uh, came into question of whether uh, what is the overall scope of jurisdictional wetlands within under the Clean Water Act. And it's just now that they've actually put out new guidance which is open for comment from the public to say have they got it right. One thing that actually resulted from that uh, being contested, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service found that the rate of wetland loss accelerated 140 percent between 2004 and 2009 when it was unclear about did they have the jurisdiction or not. Standardization of delineation methods as well. Hydrology, hydric soils, hydrophytic vegetation. The training that actually has to occur such that you people feel confident that those who go out to assess whether the wetlands are actually there or not, they have the qualification to make a, val a, a good decision that yes, that is a wetland, or no, it's not a wetland, where the boundary of that wetland actually lies as what we have found within our own province is when we are requested as regulate, as staff of the department, we say, yes, we'll go out and tell you whether we think this is a wetland or not. However, if you don't believe us, you know, essentially perhaps what you need to do is actually go hire a professional delineator to actually make that clear distinction. And quite often what we have found is that when we talk to the people about where the wetland actually lies, they say, well, you're saying that the wetland here, I'm saying it's over here, 
I'll accept your choice of saying that, yes, I'll give up that one meter to say where that wetland is, rather than go and actually have it physically delineated by a delineator. Quite often they found that the cost associated with the delineation is less or be a lot lower than what they lose in not being able to do the activity they would like to do on that wetland itself. So professional qualifications. So we actually have training courses that are approved by the Department of Environment. Say so these are the things that must be captured within courses that are provided by external groups and that it's actually the people are tested and after they pass those tests then they can be recognized as being able to do this type of uh, delineation and uh, documentation for both environmental assessments or for permit applications. Governance again and implementation, a transparent process. Essentially, what are you going to do? How are you going to implement it? What quite often, what we actually use quite often is this whole question of the mitigative, mitigative sequence. This is used globally, very variations of it. Uh, this one is by Rio Tinto, actually, by a company, but what they look at. So they're looking at what is the predicted impact to inland ecosystems, what are the, how are they going to avoid it, where they uh, cannot avoid it, essentially, so what is left, where are the minimizing techniques that they can go in, and what is left over, where they may have to actually compensate. So the question comes down to as well is, are you compensating for every lost piece of wetland area? Or are you, do you have to avoid every wetland area? Within our process, we've looked at it and said, there are some wetlands that you must avoid at all costs. We have identified those as provincially significant wetlands under, under our policy. Those generally are wetlands that harbor endangered species wetlands that have been purchased for conservation purposes under the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, wetlands that are internationally recognized under, under Ramsar, are the ones that are in protected areas. However, that is not essentially absolute. So if society makes a decision that they actually need one of those wetlands for a particular reason, then it's a societal decision that is proved through government to say, Yes, we will allow uh, activity to occur in that wetland for societal benefit as opposed to individual benefit. But again, that is a, through an EA process, identifying all the risks associated with it. Also, they don't apply to all wetlands. All this, this mitigative approach doesn't apply to all wetlands in an EA. EAs only ap apply to wetlands of two hectares or more. So those wetlands that are below two hectares are more of just a permitting process where they approach and say, what are the avoidance mechanisms they've done? How are they going to minimize it? And how are they going to compensate for it? Again, there's different methods that are used throughout. I think one of you, under your proposed policy here for Alberta, some wetlands may not be compensated for. Here is an example in what's called the Kampala matrix from Uganda, where they look at wetlands and they identify the, uh, their importance, they're vital, valuable, dispensable, and they make their judgment accordingly in the process that they have. Some nestle are going to have to be restored, some are going to be protected entirely, and some they're not going to be as worried about. So as they have down there, forget for the time being. Importantly, I talked about before about the Nile, Governance and implementation, trade-offs, who gets the service? How do you balance that? So power for an urban, urban society or a wetland-dependent community, the values that are associated within that community itself. Some work by Mike Ackerman and Matthew McCartney looking at available water in a reservoir. How is it going to be used? You can look at it and say, well, it's going to be done for floodplains, floodplain fisheries, flood recession farming, floodplain grazing. This also may be very important for what's going on in the Mekong right now with the proposed multiple dams along the Mekong River and the importance of that flooding regime for many of the dependent communities there. 
flood dependent livelihoods. Or hydropower development, production, irrigated, agriculture, industrial production, domestic water supply. A lot of the communities, a lot of the uh, countries, China, Cambodia, Laos, are looking at damming the Mekong, for example, to get, promote their economic development, societal place, societal decision. Income, employment, and the question comes down is how do you max maximize those overall benefits? So how do you get those trade-offs actually within in the, in the, in the area? We're lucky in, uh, in Nova Scotia, we don't have to have, we don't have that type of, oh, how to put it, pressure on particular systems. Uh, we are lucky that we actually have many wetlands left within our areas. Our coastal developments are generally limited in scope. When in the implementation, one thing we have learned is the need to be flexible rather than rigid in our approach. One thing we look, taking our lesson from the United States, the last thing we want to be going involved in this litigation. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, takes generally a number of years. That's effort and time and money we'd rather spend somewhere else. So when we first start looking at it, outside, outside groups where I say, well, what you need to have is like for like. You've got to be in the same watershed. You've got to be adjacent to where the impact was occurring. And we started looking at it and say, well, there's no opportunities there to do that sort of work. So let's start looking at more of what the functional needs are within perhaps on a watershed basis. So we do it in the same watershed. We have some watersheds that have very little impact, may actually still contribute 80% of the land cover in the southwestern Nova Scotia, for example. Uh, most of, the water, most of the watershed in the area is, you could consider it as wetland, forested swamps, bogs, and fens. So do we actually need to actually restore the wetland there, or should we look someplace else where there actually has been a degraded watershed if we find a, an opportunity? Is it gonna be a third party or the same permit holder? We started off looking, if you, made the de if you did the uh, impact, you gotta do the fix. We quickly realized, well, that's not gonna work, particularly for some small areas. So we started looking at there could be a third party delivered, and how is that going to be done? Restoration or wetland creation, opportunities there. In lieu payments used for knowledge. Developing a BMPs, developed from innovative research. Other biodiversity offsets, purchase, protection of significant wetland. One thing we're looking at right now is a, uh, an area that was owned by the Nature Conservancy of Canada. It has a globally significant species a plant on it, I think it occurs in three locations globally. One of them is in Nova Scotia, and another one's in New, I think it's in the uh, New Hampshire mountains. And essentially that area, that bog itself, it's a, on a peatland, had, had been drained historically. So the question is perhaps can we use for an, a, an offset of actually using money from a damaged wetland and a company to actually do the restoration on a globally imperiled site, and it's actually even though it is in protected area. So I guess this need for flexibility. We'd rather have, we wish compliance rather than depend upon enforcement. One thing we're also trying to do is build support for the policy by working with other organizations of like mind. And quite often this is actually in the business sector. We're working on, under with forest companies. It's one of our prime industries of impacting upon the, on the landscape or using the landscape. The whole question of forest certification is very critical, identifying these as valued systems and how they work around them. How do they plan their road systems? How do they plan or when they do their, do their harvesting? Mining Association of Canada as well. You can't really predict where you're going to find your ore, it's there. You can't move it. You know you're going to have to hop if they, if there's a desire to actually uh, mine that ore. There will be some res impacts upon the the surface. So recognize that. How you're going to deal with it? Do the restoration following the completion of the mine, and actually use some offsets as well. Canada's insurance industry, working with them 
Sea level rise is a big issue in my part of the country. We recognize that we are going to have sea level rise. We are actually experiencing it now. There actually has some of the projection just based on natural rising and falling of the coastline due to, tech, to the loss of the uh, glaciers back there 10,000 years ago, the rebound and depression. We're, they're essentially starting to be flooded. So there's all the coastal protection. Or can we actually use wetlands to provide some of that infra natural infrastructure rather than relying on built infrastructure? So we're actually trying to identify where wetlands can progress, salt marsh can progress inland, how to restore some of the salt marshes that were diked out in the early 1700s by the Acadians and been maintained ever since. Whereas when you actually stand on the dike and look down, you can see, for example, you are standing on the dike, you look down, the dike is, say, six feet above the salt marsh on this side, and on this side where agriculture has been occurring for the last 300 years, where you haven't had the sedimentation, it may be down 20 feet. So prone to flooding. The question then comes down is how you're going to be maintaining those dikes in the long term. What is economically feasible to maintain? So, and finally, appliance and communications targeted messaging. You need to get that out. You got to get out the good stories to build support. Use the example, one I particularly like, is the wetland drainage in southwest Manitoba. There was an issue with the drainage, excessive nutrients going downstream, this again from the Broughton, Broughton Creek, excessive nutrients going into Lake Winnipeg, causing algal blooms, something very distant from where the impact was actually occurring. They quantified it, and essentially they took that information to, to, to the government, and they essentially said, well, this is what it actually means. Five million tons of carbon stored in sediments and vegetation released, equivalent to 169,000 cars over emissions from 169,000 cars over 20 years. Increased phosphorus. What made it really interesting to me is they actually related it to something people could really understand. They took that amount of sediment and nutrients and converted it actually into fertilizer. Bags of fertilizer. What's that actually mean? So they actually converted it and said, well, that's really 544,000 seven kilogram bags of fertilizer each year. What you need to envisage is 10 semi trucks, 20 tons per truck, driving up to Lake Winnipeg and dumping their load. Very graphic image. So essentially quantifying your message to deal with that's something people can very quickly and easily understand, not in kilograms per hectare, tons per year, or so on. So the lessons that we've learned from our policy experience, it's long term and it's an ongoing process. We aren't finished. We need to develop a solid knowledge base and we're working forward to try to do that whether it's in our wetland inventory, whether it's in functional assessment, doing status and trends, best management practices. We need to continue to create political and public interest and support by using the right arguments, finding and nurturing allies in our approach, implementing clear and transparent governance structures and processes, and recognizing that policy is living and adaptable. Never finish, must be nurtured. And I thank you. Mm -hmm.